Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Time with the SL. We thank God for a beautiful Thursday. Let us pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal love of our Father come down upon us today. May we be blessed and guided as we follow a Christian path in life. May each thing we learn here today help us to grow and learn as Christians so that we may bring your light, O Lord, to the world. Amen. Good evening again, everyone. Um, I hope you are finding this um, series as interesting as I am finding it. Today we are looking at what God expects when we mess up. What God expects when we mess up. We are taking our text from Luke 15, 11 to 32. Talking about a young boy, John. He was reared in a fine Christian home. And when he was only nine years old, his dad, his dad took him to the office one day and explained the gospel to him. And at that young age, at nine, Johnny accepted Christ as his savior. And in the growing years after, John actually felt that, he said to his dad then, that he felt that God was calling him to some kind of service, some kind of Christian service. But as his adolescent years approached, young Johnny felt peer pressure, and of course we know the resulting temptations. Soon he found himself overwhelmed by them and he gave into the pressure of smoking, drinking, and he even experimented with drugs. And what started off as a fairly stable childhood for him, his life became quite tumultuous. His emotions began to rage, his hormones went out of control, and all of a sudden he felt this need, he needed to escape. It was not that he had an unhappy life because he had a family that cared for him. And you know, for a lot of, a lot of people, you will find that this might be what you are going through or a sibling is going through. That everything in the house is normal, but you know, there's just some battle that is being fought. Johnny still had more than he needed but he wanted to escape. There was something that kept on telling him that there's better out there, better out there. So finally one day he decided to act. His parents had gone to work. He loaded his car, and he had a car. He was a young teen or young adult and set out on an undirected journey. Several hours later, he was lost, hungry, cold, out of money. And um, he then reached out to a friend of his and um, of course while all this was going on his parents had alerted the police and they were searching for him I think at this point Johnny couldn't fight any longer and the police brought him back home or rather he was taken to he went to the police station his parents came to get him from the police station of course the parents were angry they were upset but they were happy that they had their son they restored him back to his position as son, you know. Of course, they won't disown him just because he rebelled against them, but, you know, the house was a bit more challenging. Throughout his teenage years, Johnny kept on disappointing his parents, but they kept on loving him. And um, it was a few more years of challenges for them, but... In his 20s, Johnny felt again the call, that pull. That call that he had neglected during his teen years, and he recommitted his life to God, accepted the call into full-time ministry, and today he is a pastor. He has been accepted back into not just his fold, the fold of his, his earthly parents, but even his heavenly father. And Johnny is a pastor in one of the churches and that's a true story, but we all know the story of the prodigal son. Jesus was the one who told us the story about a father with two sons. The younger son had approached his father one day, demanding his share of the inheritance. And if you understand what it means, when you ask your father to give you inheritance, you only get inheritance when your father is dead. So it's, it's very painful for the father. Very painful. It's a very painful thing if your child asks for, your, for his inheritance while you are yet living. According to custom, the older son received two-thirds and the younger received one third. It was quite an unusual divide. 
to the estate before the parents' death, but it was not illegal. You could ask for your own inheritance. So it was not an illegality that the son was doing. It was something that had been done before, but you wait for your father to die. After receiving his share, the young boy converted it into cash and set out for a country. He must have felt like Johnny wanted to get away from home, he needed something new. And when he was in that distant country, we are told that this young man squandered all the money. And while he had that cash, he had a lot of friends. He could show them a good time. But of course, once the money was gone, so were the friends. Now, in addition to the poverty that this boy found himself in, in that particular land, there was great famine, a severe famine. And there was little in the way of a safety net for him. It's pretty much like, you know, life is so amazing. I remember when Obasanjo, I just thought about it yesterday, that when Obasanjo was president of Nigeria, there was a middle class. And then all of a sudden, there is no middle class any longer. You're either wealthy or you're poor in Nigeria. That's a administration for another day. I think the um, government of APC need to really think very well about what it is they are doing with this country. Anyway, we are told that this young man hired himself out to a citizen of the country. And that one sent him to go and feed the pigs. Ha! This man was a Jew. That would have been the most reprehensible job ever. But he had hit rock bottom. And the story tells us that he was so hungry that he desired to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. In that particular area, excuse me, in that particular area, the carob tree produced a pod used to feed the pigs. Sometimes poor people ate it, so don't think when they say the pigs' food, it wasn't particular, it wasn't food just for pigs. So human beings could have eaten it. And it was when this boy was going through this um, terrible situation. And we are told that he came to his senses. He came to his senses, just like young John. And if you look at that phrase, it means to literally he repented. It was a turning point in his life. He thought of the family he had left. He realized that his father's servants <laughs> had more than he now did. There was food to spare also. And there he was starving to death. So he decided to return home. His plan was he would approach his father, tell him he has sinned against him and against heaven. Beg his father to restore him, even as a servant. He knew he was no longer worthy to be called his father's son. Of course, right now, he had no claim legally of sonship anymore. And even morally, he was unfit to be a son. So after formulating this plan, he went home. Now, the story tells us, you know, why it's so good to read stories and read them over and over again? Because you then are able to have a better picture of what's going on. We are told that while still a good distance from home, his father saw him. So either evidently the father is to stand outside in the evening and just look, maybe this boy will come home. I'm sure the father would have hoped and longed for his son's return. So one day out of many that he spent looking out, he saw the son coming. The father was filled with compassion. He said the father ran to the son, threw his arms around him, kissed him repeatedly. You know? And of course, we know that that kissing was a way of expressing sincere affection in that particular part of the world. The son then gave his father that rehearsed speech of his unworthiness to be a son and of his desire that his father should take him in as a servant. It was as if the father didn't even hear what the boy was saying. He just told the servants, oh yeah, come, 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 go and bring the best robe. Put a ring on a finger, sandals on his feet. In short, it was restoration. We're putting you back where you were before. Kill the fatted calf and a feast was about to ensue. The son that was dead is now alive. After all, that robe was what a beloved child should be wearing. The ring proved authority to act. And it was only people who were free that wore shoes. So the father was saying, son, restoration complete. And in those days, beef, although they were herdsmen, beef was a delicacy that was kept for special occasions. And we are told that when the older son returned from his work in the field, he wondered that what was happening, what was all the feasting and excitement about? He called one of the servants to find out what's happening. He told them of his younger brother's return. He was told of the younger brother's return. And a feast was being given to celebrate. And instead of rejoicing over this, he was very angry. He objected to his father, telling him, I I've worked all these years. You have not even killed a chicken for me. You have never treated me this way. 
this boy who came squandered all that you have worked for dad and the story is Jesus was just challenging the religious leaders who rejected him to see the older the older brother's behavior as representative of their own yes the prodigal son and young Johnny they have much in common they both messed up they abandoned their family but they also have a lot in common in that they were both accepted back by their family now this isn't right or reason for us to go and say okay well it's in the bible i just mess up and my family must take me back i mess up and wherever i've messed up to well this is the example in the bible no let me explain something to you the bible makes it very plain that every individual has messed up but the mess up is actually more serious than we realize because god calls the mess up sin and sin separates us from god sin always remember that sin separates us from god sin is more than a mere mistake sin is not a mistake don't look at sin and say i made a mistake sin is rebellion against god every time we sin we are telling god piss off i know that that is bad we are entangled every time we sin we are entangled we are even chained you know what it is to be entangled in something i think maybe you should go and 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 get a dictionary and read what it is to be entangled Ever since Adam willingly rebelled against God by eating fruit from the tree, God had commanded him not to. Each individual has possessed the sin nature of when you do what you are not supposed to do, you become entangled. And the bottom line is this, that we also mess up when we go looking in strange places for what we already have. Look at it now. Those things that you have done that have brought shame and reproach to your life. You had that thing, but there was something else. Something that seemed like more than what you wanted. But you didn't realize you already had it. So both the prodigal son and Johnny went looking in strange places, yet had to return to their home to find out what they had left. Left to ourselves, we will rebel against God. And we will never come to him unless he came to us just as the prodigal's father, prodigal son's father did. Now, I don't know about any of you. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in anyone's life. I can only speak for myself. But many of us are in different enormous messes. What does God expect of us? What are we to do? Number one, number one, God expects you and I to take responsibility. When you are in a mess, you need to take responsibility. Stop blaming other people. To rectify their mess, both Johnny and the prodigal son had to take responsibility for their actions. The Bible says the prodigal son came to himself. He came to his senses. He repented of his error. He chose to go in a different direction. Had he never taken the responsibility, his father would never have found him. He had to go back home. So we too must, make, we must take responsibility for the mess that we find ourselves in. The Bible commands us to repent of our wickedness. It commands Christians to confess their sins to God. I didn't ask you to confess your sins to any man, not to any pastor, not to any Jew. Confess to God. You have direct contact with God. If there is ever or there was ever a message we need to hear in society today, you don't need all this nonsense prosperity gospel that people, all this nonsense gospel of sow seed, etc. It's all those things are rubbish. This, the message we need to hear today is the need to take responsibility. I was talking to a young married, uh, a young married man the other day and I said, let me tell you, marriage is responsibility. That is what it is. As with every other thing in life is responsibility all around us are examples of those that are failing to take responsibility for their actions you have men you impregnate girls you leave them to fend for themselves in the process you place burden on taxpayers to pay for the child that they should pay for look at it you have orphanages all these orphanages that are coming up the reason why they're orphanages is because they are all they are unwanted children nothing more than that parents abandon or abuse the children that god has given them because they are just they are just not able to do people are they are taking smoking taking drugs living lifestyles that are higher than above what you can you can deal with you have somebody will tell you it's time to pay school fees you're running around looking for your children's school fees you had a whole term you had a whole year to pay the school fees but yet there are things you did perhaps you traveled for summer you have people that want to travel even in covid times you want to travel for the summer you haven't thought that in september you're going to pay your children's school fees 
Why don't you pay your children's school fees? You will just respect yourselves and stay at home. And you will find things to do. No, you want to travel for summer. Children blaming their bad behavior on being raised in a bad environment. Students blame the teachers. Congregation blames the pastor. Employee will blame the employer. Citizens blame the government. And it just keeps on going on and on and on. Nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. I tell people, get over it. And, you know, sometimes it makes people feel that I am harsh. But it's the truth. Get over it. Everyone is dealing with one challenge or another. We all are responsible to God. We live in an age when the message is escape your responsibility. We need to hear this. God is the ultimate one you and I are going to answer to. On judgment day, whether you like it or not, you are going to give an account. And when you give that account, you suddenly realize that this thing you are saying is rubbish. Number two, God expects us to receive his forgiveness. The prodigal son did this. His father, in spite of the younger son, all that he had done. The father was angry. He was mad. He chose to forgive his son for his actions. I was telling a sister today. I said, let me tell you. For you to move forward, you must forgive. After all, God forgave you now. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since Jesus Christ has died, have you stopped sinning? No. Did God throw you away? No. The son accepted that forgiveness and was restored to his position as son, not as a servant as he has requested. As he had requested. The son had to receive forgiveness for the relationship to be restored. If you want to restore a relationship, especially sisters, your husband has cheated on you. Okay, fine, he has cheated. Mm -hmm. And don't you cheat on God? One day we are going to have something for, for me. And I'm not saying, no, please, I'm I don't I don't put I'm not making I'm not making light of infidelity. Not at all. I'm not telling the sister, I say, you know. After everything is restored, chances are he's going to do this thing again. You may marry another man, he will do the same thing to you. It's a weakness. Because you are being responsible, doesn't mean someone else is going to be responsible. But then when you buy those things and you hide them from your spouse, why do you hide them? Why do you hide them? Isn't that a form of cheating? Isn't that a form Of not letting people know what it is you are doing. God desires to solve our sin problem and can because of the work Jesus Christ did at Calvary. The price has been paid for our sins. Our responsibility is to accept the forgiveness of Christ. And the only way our relationship with him can be restored is by repenting and asking God for forgiveness. Number three, God expects us to repent. The prodigal son came to himself. This involves the idea of repentance. The resulting actions show the genuineness of his, of his repentance. Not only was he sorry for his actions, but he decided to do something to rectify them. He returned to his father. He went back in the direction that he was coming from. He had left the life of debauchery and wickedness. His actions demonstrated the idea that, be, that you know, and there is an idea behind repentance. Repentance tells us it's going in a different direction. A lot of the time we say we have repented, but we'll be justifying and you are still doing the same thing. We are, for us to find favor with God, we must repent. You must repent. God commands us to repent of our sins and to follow him. You cannot follow him unless you repent. It's impossible. You cannot. So let me tell you, if you are here right now and you are doing something you know you are not meant to do, and you say to yourself you are stopped, eh, okay, God knows I've stopped, but you have not repented. You are not following God. You are following that devil that is right now controlling you. In our fallen state of sin, we are moving away from God. We are moving away from God. So you have to move back toward God. And you cannot do this without repentance. You can't do this without repentance. Understand this, that God does not, God is not static. He expects us to move on. The prodigal son, just as young Johnny moved on with his life, moved on they did not wallow in the sorrow of their past sins and failures and there were many like you and i have many for some
anybody here, you have messed up big time. You are asking yourself, how am I going to get out of this mess? Well, talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. Repent. And go back. Go back in the opposite direction from where you are now. You see, when God forgives us of our sins, he expects us to move on with our life. We cannot wallow in the mire of regret. Because if you do that, then you will never go forward. You will never move forward. If God says, I forgive, then believe it. Believe it. <laughs> yes, you may be a product of your past, but the Bible never said you are a prisoner of your past. You are not a prisoner of your past. And I want to close now. The story of a young boy who had a very hard time remembering where he left things. So he decided to write a note to himself, identifying where everything was. And it went something like this. Your shoes are under the bed. Your clothes are on the chair. Your cap is hanging in the closet. Your money, your knife, and your baseball cards are on the chest of drawers. In the morning, he found everything precisely as the note indicated, with one exception. When he looked in the bed, he was not there. He could not find himself. Beloved, like the prodigal son and young Johnny, we must find ourselves. We must. And this involves taking responsibility for our actions. It involves accepting God's forgiveness for our sins and repenting of our sins. And once we have done that, move on with your life. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this word we've heard this evening. It's a tough one. So we come before you, Lord, and we say, we ask for forgiveness for everything we've done to you. Everything, Lord. Father, we offer up this prayer of forgiveness, Lord, in hopes that you will look at our mistakes and know that we did not mean, Lord, to hurt you when we started whatever it is that we started. Lord, whatever it is, we didn't mean to hurt you. And Lord, you know that we are not perfect. We know you know that. And we know that what we have done, we have gone against you. But we are praying and hoping, Lord, that you will forgive us. Just as you forgive others like us. Our Lord and our God, we are praying right now that we will change. Father, help us so that we do not give in to temptation again. Lord, you are the most important thing in our lives. And Father, what we have done is disappointing. Our Father and our God, as we move forward, Lord, Father, we ask that you provide us with guidance in the future father we are asking for that discerning ear and open heart to hear and feel what you are telling us to do our lord and our god father we will not go back we are praying that we will have the understanding to remember this time and we know that you give us the strength to walk in a completely different direction in the mighty name of jesus Father, we want to thank you for all that you do for us. Father, we want to thank you that we don't even need to cry out to you. Father, you know the content of our hearts. You know what we are, we are fighting with. Thank you for all you do for us, Father. We ask you this evening to pour your grace upon us. In your name, we pray, Amen. Father, this message, I don't know about other people, but it's humbled me because we make so many mistakes. Each day we wake up, we hope for a better start, and yet we mess up again. Father, forgive us for the times we have made choices that are not pleasing to you. Father, show us the areas of our lives where there are offenses, even where we don't realize. You are the God of new beginnings. Thank you for the many times you have granted us, Lord, that do-over. And as many times, Lord, as you have pardoned us and let us start, Grant us, Lord, the same grace to offer the same spirit of forgiveness and mercy.
to those people that have also wronged us in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God, hmm. we want to thank you for second chances. Father, let us not take second chances for granted because we never know when that second chance might just be a last chance. Help us, Father. Help us, Father. For we have prayed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. O oh Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you, Lord, that we can live in your light and walk in your truth. May the things you have revealed to us today and the thoughts that you have shared with us today dwell in our hearts and stir us to action. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I thought yesterday was touching. Oh Lord, I know that God wants to deal with all our messes and those messes he will turn to a message for each and every one of us. Thank you for sharing your evening with me at rebirth.